this discussion was going to be given the first of the first discussion last month but we didn't have it because we didn't have power so I'm giving it this I decided I'm not going to write another one so I'll just do this one and this is an overview that spans time and place it's an ongoing series of discussions on women in Buddhism and future presentations are more limited sticking to a particular period of time specific places and in some cases specific uh, ancestors um, the prologue so as part of the prologue Women have historically been discriminated against by all Buddhist schools, and as Diana Winston writes in the foreword to the first Buddhist women poems and stories of awakening by Susan Marcotte, uh, Diana writes, as a practicing Buddhist and practicing feminist, I've always had a hard time reconciling my love of the Buddhist teachings with what I saw as historical Buddhists, Buddhism's dismissive attitude toward women. And women have made significant contributions to Buddhism in spite of the discrimination. So Diana goes on to say, but I was a Buddhist, that was clear. I was too devoted to my meditation practice and too enamored by what I was discovering on the path to stop now. As for the status of women in historical Buddhism, I figured I just have to not focus on it. What she was exposed to were feminist Buddhist scholars, and she went on to become a nun for a year in Burma. And it was through historic and contemporary women's accomplishments in Buddhism that changed her life and direction. Most Buddhist schools have become, ah, see, that's when we run into the problem again. Um, most Buddhist much. schools have become more open to equal participation for by women. However, there has always been a place for women uh, in the society at large. And so as society has become more egalitarian, in many places of the world, a reimagining of the role of women in Buddhism has led to greater participation and equality, while at the same time not complete. In many cases, it is more so than in society at large. And also by way of by way of stipulations. Today we're not going to be deliberating a critique of Buddhist gender discrimination. There's an entire genre of publications that deal with that subject, and I'm not dismissive of it. As a matter of fact, I encourage it, because it is only through knowing what has been that we can change what is to be. We will be discussing women's contributions to and participation in Buddhism. Knowing what has been, the discrimination, is the first phase of the journey. Knowing the contributions and accomplishments is the next phase. That is what we will pursue this evening. Thus, we build a positive image rather than one of oppression. It is not a denial nor an apologist perspective, but a reconstructivist position. We'll start from the beginning and then we'll build upon what we know. As Meeks writes, in recent decades, and this is a quote, in recent decades, the use of interdisciplinary methods combined with greater attention to non-doctrinal and extra canonical sources has helped illuminate the diverse roles of women in the history of East Asian Buddhism. Some of the sources that have proven most useful include narrative literature, poetry, hagiography, legal codes, and everyday historical documents, such as personal correspondence and records of payments or land transfer. The study of material objects, such as monuments and epigraphs, has also helped scholars gain a deeper understanding of the religious activities undertaken by nuns and laywomen. And it started from the Pali Canon. <clears throat> the establishment of the Bhikshuni order is considered as something revolutionary in India 2,500 years ago. Women in that area, in that era, had almost no outlets for self-expression outside the home. The existence of an order of nuns enabled them to express their talents in a way that would not have been possible otherwise. The extension of monastic principles to women was even more revolutionary. 2,500 years ago in India, um, women were considered to be 
people who stayed home. And even when they attempted to join the religious orders at that time, they still were not provided monasteries. And the reason for that was they didn't have the patronage. The men would have people who would um, say, use my grove or use my uh, orchard or whatever it may have been as your resting place. But that was not given to women. Now, part of that was, in fact, that women were in a position whereby they could be exploited by men sexually and otherwise, and quite often were. And so therefore, in order to avoid that, then people didn't want to sort of set up a a place where women were going to be were going to be exploited. That was the, the explicit reason behind it. Involvement of women in formal religious life in India was either non-existent or marginal. Once the Order of Bhikshunis was founded, a large number of distinguished women from various social backgrounds came to join the order, attracted by the power of Buddhist teachings and the freedom for which the new order offered them. Many of these bhikshinis attained awakening. The stories, sayings, and deeds of these distinguished bhikshinis are recorded in many places in the Pali Canon, most notably in the Terigata, verses of the elder nuns. And don't mistake Terigata for Teragata. It's Terry with an I, which indicates the feminine. Terra indicates a larger order. Um, so the Terigata was translated as Verses of the Elder Nuns. A compilation of verses composed by these Teris when they became aware of the Dhamma, and which constitutes a part of Kodaka Nikaya and the Sutta Pitaka. So it was a formalized part of the, of the Pali Canon. The Terigata contains passages reaffirming the view that women are the equal of men in terms of spiritual attainment as well as verses that address issues of particular interest to women in ancient South Asian society. Among those are in the Udana recorded in the Terigata, of which some of the best named knowns in early Buddhism are reside. The members of the order belong to all walks of life. Some were former farmers, others were of royal lineage. They were distinguished exponents of the Dharma, offsprings of noble or merchants, not to mention those of humbler origin, slaves and poor Brahmins. The actual number of the Terries involved is not really known. In future discussions, I will provide some of the poetry from these early Buddhist nuns, which is really, from my aesthetic appreciation, I don't find it especially beautiful, but it's incredibly informative, if you will. But let's discuss some of the early accomplishments and milestones of women's contributions. And I think that we have to start from the very beginning. And when we start from the very beginning, it's Shakyamuni Buddha's awakening. A woman contributed to his awakening. Sujata, a milkmaid who was said to have fed Gautama Buddha a bowl of rice milk gruel, ended his six years of severe aestheticism. Such was his emaciated appearance that she wrongly believed him to be a tree spirit that had granted her wish of having a child. The offering provided him enough strength to start the meditation, and this cultivated the middle path. And I would maintain that actually, you know, we view the middle path as when Shakyamuni Buddha recognized that the two sides of the extremes, the, the side of the extreme of complete aestheticism contrasted the side of a, a hedonistic sort of life that he must have experienced when he was a quote-unquote prince living in his father's palace. We, we often view that as the middle way. But in many ways, I consider Sujata's offering him uh, the rice gruel as being the real foundation of the middle way because he had been suffering from the asceticism uh, it, when we talk about asceticism, we're talking about practices such as eating one date a day. That was it. That was their food. So the guy must have looked like a, like a skeleton. Um, the offering provided him the time to start his meditation. 
Well, he cultivated the middle path, developed jhana, and attained Anuttava Samyaksa Bodhi thereafter, becoming known as Shakyamuni Buddha. There are at least three totally different recollections of this in the Pali Canon, and several more in the Mahayana Canon. What's important to keep in mind is, if Sujata had not intervened, he would not follow Shakyamuni Buddha's teachings today, because he would have died. Pretty severe. So we're going to move on to Maya and Pajapati. Maya, his mother, died soon after the birth of Siddhartha, generally said to be seven days afterwards. Thus Maya did not raise her son, who was instead raised by his maternal aunt, Maha Pajapati. Pajapati was her name. She's referred to as Maha Pajapati now, Ma being the great or greater Gautami. Maya would, however, on occasion descend from Buddhist heaven to give advice for her son. I think that's important. But he was getting he was getting her advice. She was, of course, the woman who appealed to and convinced Shakyamuni Buddha to permit women as Sangha members, approximately five years after the first uh, Sangha he established. Of all the Buddha's great disciples, male or female, Pajapati Gautami, the Buddha's maternal aunt and stepmother, is the only one whom legend described as a counterpart to the Tathagata himself, which is really interesting. They don't view um, Shariputra or Mahamogliane or Kasapya or the others as being the counterpart to the Tathagata. It's the woman which was his stepmother and who raised him who was viewed as his counterpart, in other words, equal to him. Pajapati was a sister of Shakyamuni Buddha's biological mother, Maya, and both of them were married to the king, Sudahana, the Buddha's father. After Maya, Shakyamuni Buddha's mother, died a few days after giving birth, Pajapati took the role of being mother, raised Siddhartha Gautama until his marriage to Yasadhara, when they were both 16 years, 16 years old. As an elderly woman, she became a zealous disciple of Shakyamuni Buddha, attained awakening, and after hearing just a, a brief discourse on the Dharma and the Vinaya, and founded the first order of Buddhist nuns, and they numbered over 500. Despite obstacles prior to ordination, to demonstrate her perseverance, she decided to take on a journey of enlightenment. She shaved her head, bald like that of a monk, wore robes, and walked several miles to the Buddha's next destination. What was unusual was that she had a large crowd of women, women who followed her, and this symbolized her natural leadership qualities, not to mention that her name means leader of the great assembly. That's what the Ma, Ma Pajapati uh, refers to. And and here, I, I you know, it struck me the two women that we've talked about thus far, and we will be talking about, what I find interesting is that in the various tales today, I'm not talking about the tales in the Pali or the Mahayana canon that were written in India or China uh, and other places after that, that they're just not mentioned. In other words, I, I, I suspect many of you have heard about Maya and Pajapati, etc., uh, and Sujata, but we don't make as big a deal of it as we make out of people like Shariputra, which was uh, Shakyamuni Buddha's uh, eldest disciple. Not, well, he was his eldest disciple, but most fervent disciple. So. We're going to go on to Patakara. As you can see, I'm choosing to tell the story through the women, not just as a means of explaining the role of women, but in this case, what, who are the personalities? When we talk about people like, like um, Shariputra, or we talk about Masakapya or whomever, it's through the people. We tell these stories through the people, but for somehow we haven't been telling the stories through the women. 
than telling it through the men. I think that's one of the reasons we get a distortion of the role of women in Buddhism for that reason. That's just my own editorial. So Patakara experienced a tragedy that led her to Jetta Grove where Shakyamuni Buddha was preaching. In this story, Patakara was the daughter of a banker in Sahabati who fell in love with one of her parents' family servants. She ran away with him. Bad move. They had two children, and without going into great detail, the, 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 the detail on this is amazing when you get to it, but we, can't, we don't have time to go there. First, her husband died, and then she went to return to her parents' home. Then, her two children died. First, a newborn was taken by a hawk. A hawk swooped down and carried it away. And that's why I say we know details about these people. These aren't, aren't apocryphal mm -hmm. stories. And the older child was drowned. Distraught, she wandered around until her clothes became ragged and fell off of her. Her name means cloak walker. And the town people drove her off with sticks. Naked and distraught, she found herself in Jetta Grove, where Shakyamuni Buddha was teaching. He, pasted, he placed a coat, cloak around her shoulders and she told him the story and he consoled her. She asked if she could be ordained and Buddha accompanied her to the nun's Sangha where she was accepted there. She is considered an extraordinary woman and one of the most powerful personalities in the early Buddhist community. She was skillful, revered, and a charismatic teacher. Patakara led a bhikshu sangha of 30 nuns, and she exercised a degree of authority. She gathered and tra trained her own disciples, and she preached to lay people. As mentioned previously, the poetry of these teragata is well known. This is where the poetry comes from, is from um, her, her uh, sangha. Moving along, we're going to go to East Asian Buddhism and China. An evidence of Buddhist nuns in China does not emerge in the historical record until the Sixth Dynasties period when Buddhism gained a foothold in China. This is this, when we talk about the Buddhist, Buddhists' introduction to China, this is the period we're talking about. This was about the, well, this was the period which stretches from the fall of the Han Dynasty in 220 CE to the unification of the Sui dynasty in 589 CE. And many rulers became fervent devotees of Buddhism and enforced strict rules of ordination. In general, not much is known, but can be inferred from Biguni Zuan, which narrates the lives of 65 Buddhist nuns active with between the times of the Eastern Jin and Leon, which is basically from 317 to 547. In its introduction, the Biguan Zitan declares its purpose. It seeks to record the lives of eminent Buddhist nuns so that others may model their own lives on the excellent virtuousness of these women. And that's by Bao Cheng. Uh, the text provides some insight then into the attributes that an early 6th century monk found admirable in the Buddhist nuns. And that is to say that this is a work that is historical. It was published at the time, and then it was translated sometime later. According to the Bigun Zuan, the first Chinese woman to receive official training in ordination was Zhu Jing Lian. 7292-361. The nuns featured in the Zitan were portrayed as having the same qualities for which monks were celebrated. They were praised not only for their virtue and filial piety, but also for their intelligence, aptitude, and learning, and their administrative skills, as well as their meditation abilities. Bao Cheng writes that these nuns as rigorously aesthetic, many are said to have refused marriage, even in the face of great social pressure, to have delighted in rough clothing and austere vegetarian dishes, and to have made offerings of the flesh. 
Now, offerings of the flesh, by the way, means, and you'll find it throughout much of the Chinese literature, both males and females. Um, there's a section, for instance, in the Lotus Sutra where the Buddha sh shaves off some flesh. There's many tales of shaving off flesh to give to a, uh, in one case, it's a, what, what kind of cat is that? It was a tiger. tiger. In another case, the shaving off the flesh to be used for writing sutra onto, etc. That was considered, uh, you know, an offering. And so that's what it's referring to when it's said to make, making offerings of the flesh. Bao Chang treats these nuns both as holy women and as charismatic religious leaders. And I think that that's what's important to keep in mind, that these weren't women who were merely devout. I, I shouldn't use the term merely who were devout, but they were religious leaders in their, at, during this period of time. He also describes some nuns as having attracted large numbers of disciples, both lay and monastic, and he portrays many as having earned the personal devotion of emperors, empresses, princes, royal ladies, governors, and other elites. He says that some of these nuns were invited to the palace of royalty to give lectures on the sutras. They were the teachers of an emperor and performed rituals for members of the, royal, of the royalty. Just to keep in mind, when we're, this is early. This is, is you know, during uh, the third and fourth centuries. And it's early, but these rituals were often intended for the salvation of the nation and for the imperial family and that sort of thing. The people that got to do these had to be very well esteemed. These were not your, you know, run of the mill equivalent to diocesan priests. These were, you know, well known, uh, well esteemed individuals. Um, so, Let's discuss one of these extraordinary women for today. There's, there's a bunch of them that I could go into. And for this discussion, I chose just one. And that's Zongqi. And Zongqi, oops, what did I do? There we go. Zongqi was the daughter of Liang Dynasty Emperor. She was ordained as, as a nun at the age of 19 and eventually became a disciple of the Bodhidharma, the first patriarch of Zen in China. And she was one of the four Dharma heirs of the Bodhidharma, meaning that she completely understood the teachings. Zongqi appears in a well-known story. To quote from Sally Tisdale's <laughs> Women of the Way, Zongqi had grown up inside the court, inside the palace, inside a world, in a role. Now she was outside, outside her rank and status, that's meaning as a nun. She was outside her status, she, even sometimes outside her gender. And this is according to Tisdale. Instead of small rooms and screens and curtains, now her world was bordered by fields and storm clouds and steep mountain paths. She had grown up with the precise instructions as to her place and purpose in life, and now she found herself with no purpose but her own. Quote, To find a Buddha, all you have to do is to see your own nature, unquote, said the Bodhidharma. And around her, she seemed to see her nature in rocks, trees, stationary, solid and alive. Your nature is the Buddha, he continued, and the Buddha is the, pres is the person who's free, free of plans, free of cares, and she was. She became a person without boundaries. She seems to think in terms of high and low. She sees to think of edges of herself and the edges of the world as being different things. Language, by the way, by the way, for those who haven't been studying the Mochi Kwan or, or similar works, you'll find this language in some of those works of, of Tian Tai, uh, Hua Hien, and others talking about edges of oneself and edges of the world. How do we make a distinction between this and that? Those are the edges. 
And so in this context, what's being stated was she saw no difference between herself and the other. And that's why it was saying early on in the reading is that she extend, she exceeded her gender. You know, it gives me rise to Rita Gross's book, um, Beyond Gender, which Rita Gross, for those who don't know, is a feminist Buddhist. She died a few years ago now, but she was a feminist Buddhist and her book, uh, uh, Gender Without Borders. What was that? Buddhism Beyond Gender? Buddhism Beyond Gender is one that I recommend it to anyone. Um, now we're going to go to Japan, because how could I not go to Japan? <laughs> Buddhism was formally introduced to Japan in the mid 6th century. And the Nihon Shoki, the Chronicles of Japan, reports the first Japanese clerics. And by the way, the Nihon Shoki was the Chronicles of Japan, the first history of Japan, which actually wasn't written until the 8th century. It was written in the 700s. There were two works that were written at that time. And part of the reason for that is that the writing system was not introduced until the 6th century. And so it took a while for there to become uh, the skill in order to begin to publish books like we're talking about. So Japan's first cleric, not the first nuns, but the first clerics, the first ordinations were Zenshin, Zenzo, and Izen, who were the women ordained in 584. It was inter Buddhism was introduced in Japan, depending upon which uh, history you use, either 537 or 552. Sometimes they say 554. So this was shortly after Buddhism was formally introduced in Japan. Up until that time, up until the ordination of these nuns, there were many priests and nuns who were in Japan, but they were coming from Pachike and from China. And so they were establishing Buddhism but they were coming from the main continent. Um, they were given permission to study the nuns Vinaya in Pachike, and the women played a large role in the early flourishing of Japanese Buddhism. An entry dated to the year 624 Nihon Shiki reported that nearly half of the early clergy were female. So stop and think about that. It was introduced in Japan in the mid 6th century, and by 75 or so years later, half of all the clergy were women. Half were men, half were women. By the late 7th century, it had become common for monasteries and nunneries, as they refer to them, and don't think about it as a Shakespearean nunnery, <laughs> for those who know Shakespeare. And when they say, take me to a nunnery, they're not talking about a convent. <laughs> um, so by the late 7th century, it had become common for monasteries and nunneries to be built as paired sets. If they were going to build a monastery, they built a nunnery. And, and again, these were all by virtue of patronage, either patronage of the aristocratic families or patronage of the emperor's families. Um, but they were they were built by as a result of patronage. Documents from the Shosuin collection further illuminate the degree to which nuns were respected at court and with, er, within aristocratic households during the eighth century. In numerous examples, nuns are pra praised above monks for their ability to chant sutras and dharanis and for the clarity of their chanting voices and for the mastery of their calligraphy. Many elites of the Heian period, men and women, planned to devote their retirement years to aesthetic practices which would allow them to achieve an illustrious death. In other words, upon their death, they would then go to the Pure Land for rebirth, tip most typically. I think I got behind on clicking here, so I'll have to make this up. Excuse me. Sometimes when I get talking, I just forget to click. 
By the 11th century, taking vows as a privately ordained nun had become a standard part of the life cycle of an educated woman. Let's look at the individual women in Japan in three different historical periods of time. I love that, that sculpture, by the way. It's one of my favorites. The first we're going to discuss is Empress Komio. You're going to want to move that little box. Let's get over here. <laughs> Buddhist faith and her role in the founding of the state temple and convent system was seminal to the growth of Japanese Buddhism. <clears throat> in Miko Shiba's article in Engendering Faith, her life spans the entire rise and fall of the Ritsu Ryo legal system that defined Nara from 710 to 794, reflecting a Chinese influence. This was a a legal system that had been, there had not been a legal system previous to this. Uh, there had been some loose rules, but not a, a, a really a legal system. And the Ritsu Do, um, which lasted for a relatively short period of time in Nara, but it provided the template from which all the other legal systems took place for years after that. Um, the system contains provisions for regulating religion and fostering a unique form of state-supported Buddhism. I mean, that wasn't the entirety of it, that was just an aspect. The culture of the Nara period was richly inspired by a Buddhism that the ruling powers believed would strengthen and protect the state. In 710, when the Fujiwara clan capital was moved to Nara from Asuka, the great temples such as Yakushiji which had been built in the original capital, were dismantled and rebuilt in new locations. In addition to the establishment of the official state temples and convents, Komo Yoshi was involved in numerous projects undertaken as expressions of her faith. She established systems of social services and commissioned additions to various temples and the Buddhist representations for them. A very important role was commissioning several rounds of sutra copying and raising funds for the building of the Daibutsu, the Great Buddha, which is about 15, 15 meters or 50 feet tall in, at Todaiji Temple. And by the way, Empress Komyo was the aunt of Prince Shotoku, mm -hmm. who was the founder, considered the founder of Buddhism in Japan. So she, I, you know, any of these, I could easily do an entire evening on, you know, but this is an overview. She was a remarkable person. She also, um, it doesn't go into it, but she also provided the impetus to provide the Kokobunji, which were the uh, regional temples that were established in each of the provinces in Japan at that time, uh, through her nephew. There's Tenmo Jorin, and Tenmo Jorin was born to an upper class family, and she asked to be a nun at the age of nine and began training immediately while still at home. The next year, with her teacher, she left for Yorin in An Temple in Kyoto. In 1884, Tenmyo became the 12th abbot of Yoroyun-an, which, became, which came, had been in existence since the 1500s. And in 1890, she became the Dharma heir of a male teacher, which was extremely unusual. And it was very unusual at that time for women to practice with men at all. After this, she was received by the abbot of Aheji. In 1902, Tenmyo became the national leader of nuns. She was born as the shogunate was dissolving. The Meiji Restoration was occurring just as she became an adult, and during this time, half the men were literate and about 15% of the women. Rank and authority in Buddhist schools was limited to nuns because of their lack of education. After the Meiji Restoration, the persecution of Buddhism was decreed. So what's really being st stated here was that she lived during this incredible period of time in which she was born, well, the shogunate dissolved, uh, the shogunate 
came to an end in 1872. So she was born when there was still a shogunate. She went on to become a nun at a relatively young age. She lived during a time in Japan with the Meiji Restoration in which all Japan was on a course of modernization that I think has been unparalleled in history. If it took 300 years for the Industrial Revolution in Europe, it took 50 years for Industrial Revolution to take place in Japan. It went from a feudal society with Japan, I'm speaking of, went from a feudal society and in 1854 when Perry went into uh, Edo Bay and made his proclamations which shook things up and the Japanese said, hey, if we don't do something about this real quick, we're going to look like China. We're just going to be another colony. And it went from that to being an imperial power when it, when it beat the Russian army in 1892. <laughs> Amazing! Amazing! When you think about it, during that period of time, they established, well, aside from the persecution of Buddhism, they established schools, they established an army that could fight against the Russians, they established universities, they established uh, schools, school system. They didn't have a police force the way we think about it before that time. They didn't have fire departments that were fire departments that we think about now. The fire department previous that time were construction workers that would run into an area where there was a building burning and knock down all the other buildings to keep those buildings from catching on fire. So this was a time of, of incredible uh, change in Japan. And so what was really important about this is that this woman had lived during that period of time. And by 1902, she became, as it says, um, the leader of the nuns in Japan. To have a single person as leader of all the nuns was a remarkable feat. There was not something equivalent to that for the monks. But there was also educational reform, and Tenmyo instituted a formal training system for nuns. Now I'm going to bring us up to more or less the present, and a person that Tamami and I got to know um, really well. I, I can't say that we knew her really well, but I have to say that she had the best sake that I've ever tasted. <laughs> it, was, it was her own sake that she had brewed. So that's how, how, hold, how high is he my holder. Uh, Satuchi Jakucho uh, was born in Tokushima in 1922, formerly Satuchi Harumi, attended Tokyo Women's Christian University, which was a very elite university at that time, run by, by uh, Quakers and graduated with a degree in Japanese literature. I'm sorry? Oh, I thought it was too long to say something. Uh, but, and by the way, just a, a little side note on Women's Christian University. Many people are not aware of the effect of the Quakers on the imperial family. From the time of Perry's entering Japan until late, maybe even earlier, there's word that might have been earlier, um, every emperor's mother had been trained by the Quakers and every emperor's wife was trained by the Quakers. They didn't become Quakers, but that was the school that they went to because they felt that that was an outstanding education for young women. And so, she, as I said, uh, mm -hmm. no. Jacko Cho um, graduated with a degree in Japanese literature. Now, here's where it gets really interesting. After an affair with one of her husband's students, who was a professor at, I think, at Todai, at the University of Tokyo, she left her house and got an official divorce to leave for Tokyo and pursue a writing career. 
So she was somebody who had a mind of her own. And it was very unusual for a woman to get a divorce in, in those days. And Jacques Cho's first literary award was for Kashin, and it was criticized as pornography. Upon being awarded the Women's Literary Prize for Natsu no Awadi, she proved herself to be a legitimate serious writer. In 1973, she took Buddhist vows and became a Tendai Buddhist nun at Josonji Ten Temple in Hiraizumi in Awate Prefecture and received her name Jakucho. And by the way, for those, when, when Tamami and I were living in Japan in the, you know, the 19, late 80s, early 90s, you would see her on an evening talk show quite often. She mm -hmm. was she was a real celebrity. Um, and she also received, uh, she also received, did I do the, yeah. She also received one of Japan's more prestigious literary awards, the Tanazaki Prize for her novel, Ananitoe in 1992. She wrote the best-selling translation of Tales of Genji, which for those of us who have been involved in Japanese literature is, is you know, the, how would you refer, refer to it as Tomiya? It's like the classical text that must be read. Yeah. Uh, Tales of Genji was written by a woman, a woman novelist, but it was, it, it, in, in some ways, I would, in today's world, I would consider it more of a, uh, semi-fictional work because she was really writing about the interior of the palaces from day to day and so uh, most of the scholars who study that say that while it was a novel she wasn't using the real names you can easily identify the people mm -hmm. that she wrote about looking at the historical texts mm -hmm. and so it was semi semi yes, yes. Um, uh, so she wrote that, and she was honored as a person of cultural merit. In, in 2006, she was awarded the Order of Culture of Japan, which is one of their highest orders. In 2016, she helped found the nonprofit World of Women's Project to support young women experiencing abuse, exploitation, drug addiction, and poverty. In 2017, she published her novel, Inochi Life, and then continued to publish her writing in literary magazines. At the time of her death, her home temple was in Kyoto, Sagano area, and Setouchi died of heart failure on November 9, 2021, at the age of 99. <laughs> One of her more favorite quotes, and I think this is worth everyone memorizing. Usually people who do bad things make good writers. I did a lot of bad things, <laughs> which is why my novels are interesting. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> and, and, I, and I can attest to the fact that she was a real character. I mean, she was someone who was just... You know, I, I knew her when she was in her night well, in her 90s, and she was still vivacious. She would have thought she was in her 60s or 70s, and she could drink most of us under the table. <laughs> <laughs> to be continued. This is the first of several presentations on women in Buddhism, their participation, their contributions, and their leadership. There are scholars who are using innovative approaches to investigating women's roles in Buddhism. This is leading to an exciting understanding that has been for too long ignored. The scholarship in this area is moving beyond the critical approach, mostly focusing on process and analysis that acknowledges power differentials, at the same time investigating the emphasis of the powerful role women have played in the development and evolution of Buddhist teachings and practices. It's up to you to engage your curiosity 
and be willing to move beyond the low-hanging fruit of criticism. Mm -hmm. And these are the sources that I use for this evening's discussion. And if anybody's interested, I'm, I'm happy to share the sources with you. However, these are the primary sources. There were other materials that I did not quote from or include in the material in the slides. And of those that are up there, I would point out, I mentioned before, uh, Rita Gross's book on Buddhism, uh, beyond Buddhism Beyond Gender. And also uh, the very first one, Chen, Reflections on Buddhism, Gender, and Human Rights uh, by uh, Lakeshi Tom, Tomo. Uh, and that's in Buddhist Women and Social Justice. Those are two of the better ones that I would that I would recommend. Meeks on um, nuns and lay women in East Asian Buddhism uh, is a bit academic and, and sometimes um, you have to plod through it. But there's lots of really good stuff in that in that uh, in that book. Um, they're all. I mean, I find that they're all worthwhile. So. <laughs> Always. <laughs> Questions and comments. <laughs> Thank you. That was fascinating. Yeah, I look forward to the next ones. Let's stop the recording. My question oh, is. Wait, wait, before, before we do that. Oh, sure. Ichishima Sensei, do you have anything that you would like to add this evening? He's muted. Sensei, you're muted. Thank you very much for your introduction about uh, nuns history from India, China, and Japan. And uh, I think uh, now in Japan, uh, Zenkoji Temple, as you know, this is a combination between Jodo Shu and the Tendai Shu. Uh, in the case of Jodo Shu, this is a uh, women uh, nuns center uh, of Japan, I think. Uh, and this is, and also, uh, <clears throat> the Sri Maharaja Sutra's translation uh, uh, by Diana Paul. And uh, she was a very, uh, I think, uh, first uh, scholar mentions about the uh, uh, Sutra of Na for women. And uh, since short, pretty short of the seventh century around, uh, at that time, Siko Tenno, Empress Siko was the ruler of Japan. And so, uh, Shoto Taishi wrote a commentary to the Sri Mara Devi Sutra, Lion's Lower Sutra, uh, for her. I think uh, this is uh, very interesting that. Uh, uh, you know, Zenkoji Temple represents such a women's uh, nuns center in Japan. And also, uh, Diana Po is, I think, pioneering scholar introducing uh, Sri Mara Devi, Lion's Lower Sutra. And Hitochi Jakcho, finally, you mentioned that she, she was a really interesting person. Uh, personally, I know him, her very well. And she was a uh, uh, disciple of uh, Kon Toko. Uh, he was also abbot at the Chuson's temple at, at the time. And coincidentally, uh, Kon Toko was, uh, the, I think he asked me to, to go to Hawaii as a, uh, you know, priest. And uh, so, and uh, it's quite uh, interesting to know those kind of things, relations. Uh, th this is very good uh, relations, when I thought. That is my thinking. Thank you. Thank you, Sensei. And now we're going to uh, stop the recording and we'll open it up to questions.